Today I'm taking one tiny little step going down a very long road of creating your own tabletop gaming miniatures with Blender. Welcome everybody, I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield, and this is the little guy we're working on today. Let me get him on the other camera so you can see what he looks like. This little guy, as far as I can tell, is named Mostly Harmless. He was created by a friend's brother, and he's the mascot of a local Halloween event called Monster Fest. That's about all I really know of him. He's going to be the focus of our first tutorial for creating miniatures with Blender. So one more final note before we get started here. Today's video is about kind of figuring out the workflow of how to create your own custom miniatures. There's a little bit of focus on the details of what I'm doing with sculpting this guy here, but it's not a step-by-step -step tutorial. Sculpting miniatures in Blender is not a easy thing. It's not like you're welcome to Blender, here's your first task of sculpting a miniature. It's a fairly advanced topic, and the assumption is you're already familiar with tools such as vertex manipulation, all your basic tools, modifiers, and even at least have a understanding of how the sculpting feature in Blender works, dynamic type topology, all that fancy fun stuff. So with that disclaimer out of the way, let's jump over to the computer and get started with making this little guy here. Here we are inside Blender. Let's talk about what's going on. I've got a basic cube right here, which has been scaled to approximately the volume of the miniature. It's not perfect, but it's close enough. And then what I have is three different reference images. So these are actually all the same reference images of my front, side, and back that were provided by the artist. And what I have done, if I jump to my different views here, let me hide some of these reference images. You can see that I basically align this cube so that when I'm on the front view, I'm on the front view. When I'm on the right side, I'm lined up with the side view. And then also, if desired, when I'm lined up with the back, I got the basically the cube is lined up with my artwork. So that's really what you see here. This way I can very easily reference the side that I'm trying to sculpt. Just makes things, certain things a little bit easier for some of the processes. Now, one important note, because I've, I've actually, I'll be honest, I've already done the sculpting at this point. And let me jump to uh, the side view, because that's where the issue is. So if I go to wireframe mode, you can see here that in the side view, my creature is facing over to the left side of my monitor. However, the front view camera is actually lives over here on the right side of the screen. So what you really want to do when you're lining up your reference images, make sure for your side view that your character is looking to the right. If you have them set up to looking to the left right here, well, you know, it can work, but you're gonna get some weird mirroring stuff you gotta deal with later. Just don't, don't do what I did and just orient him correctly from the start. Okay, let's get to the actual building process of the miniature. In my process, I want to create an approximate sketch of half the miniature. That way, later on, I can use the mirror modifier to get an exact copy for the other side. I'm starting with that cube that I had set up for the reference images. I'm going to cut it in half. And then from there, I'm going to use an assortment of vertex manipulation options to roughly shape out this character. Now, this is a combination of things like the loop cut, I'm using the knife tool, subdivide, those kind of things to add vertices. And then just edit this particular cube till it's approximately the right shape. I mean, very approximately. Obviously, you can't get any real curved surfaces yet. You're just trying to look for a very boxy outline. So the next step that we want to do is just mirror this object so that we have a complete approximate sketch of our little character here. Let me jump to our front view. We're going to jump into edit mode, go to wireframe. And if it's not already done, you want your center point here to be lined up as close to the side of your object as possible. And then let's go to our modifiers context. We want to add the mirror modifier and in this case we are mirroring across the x-axis so have that checked we want to have um, merge check which will basically merge vertices that are very close to each other 
Oh, let me jump out of edit mode and hit apply. If the merge thing worked right, I can left click once and there should only be one vertice there. Excellent. Okay. Now we're going to apply a subsurface modifier and something's going to go wrong here and I'll explain what it is in a moment. So the subsurface modifier is going to take our blocky shape and turn it into an approximate rounded shape. And then that'll give us a pretty good base for a sculpting process. Sorry, did I, keep all, I call it subsurface modifier, it's subdivision surface. It's just used to it. Okay, so let me crank it up a little bit. And it's going to get a bit of, uh, let's see here. That's, you can do, that's good enough for what we're trying to accomplish right at the moment. And what you'll notice is we got a little bit of a crease here. It's not bad, but there is a little bit of one there and we don't want that. Because what's happening, if I go back into edit mode and go to wireframe mode, there is these internal faces. And those internal faces, because of the fact that we took a solid object and mirrored it, those are messing with the subsurface modifier. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to disable this modifier right now. I'm going to go into face select mode. And we're going to very carefully select all these interior faces and then delete the faces, but not the vertices, just the faces. <laughs> to be fair, this step would probably be easier to do, you know, before you apply the mirror modifier, but you know, I'm doing a, a demo thing. So for future things, you know, you get the idea. Anyway, let's go faces. They should, oh, uh, they are all gone. So now let's turn it back on and get out edit mode. And that crease is much less visible. All right. So we've got this little blob thing and that's about as good as you're going to get using a method of taking a basic mesh and then applying a subdivision surface modifier to it. But it gives you a pretty good starting point for actually sculpting your object. So now I'm going to apply the subdivision surface modifier. And now I've got my um, kind of complex blobular mesh. And then I get the jump to sculpting mode to make it look a lot closer to the final object. So now I'm going to get my um, viewport set up for sculpting. I tend to just use the default sculpt settings up here. And this is the one point where you generally want to keep user perspective on. Normally I work in orthographic mode. When you're doing sculpting, it's helpful to have the user perspective turned on. And what I'm going to do, because I got all these crazy reference images, I'm going to start and kind of only have one reference image on at a time and kind of work with it as best I can and go from there. What I really can't do now, I can go to, you know, a wireframe mode and try to sculpt, but that's really messy. At this point, you can't really build off the artwork the way you've been doing up to this point but you can still use it obviously as a reference. So you do the best you can and go from there. So one last thing we need to do before we get started with the sculpting, I kind of forgot this is part of the process. There is a bit of an oddball scale going on. You can see a scale factor of Z of 1.99. I must have done a scale operation on the original mesh at some point. And that as well as probably this minus one can do some weird stuff to the mathematical operations of sculpting. So you need to perform a step called apply scale. It's just control A for apply, choose scale. You won't notice anything visually to your mesh, at least you shouldn't. I've never had anything weird happen, but it's just a background mathematical thing. And you'll notice that the X, Y, and Z scale factors have all been reset to one. If you're sculpting in Blender an object and you ever notice something weird where the sculpting doesn't seem to work quite right, it very likely is this scale operation. All right, now let's actually create our little monster. Some of the settings you want to turn on right now, dynamic typography is quite helpful. I'm going to drop the detail size down. Um, the settings of the brushes are up to you. And the other thing you really would, should have at this point is some sort of tablet interface. Now, Blender is generally not great for tablet interfaces, but for the sculpting process, and only the sculpting process, not all the UI stuff around it, tablet interfaces are great, whether that is like a Wacom tablet type interface, or if you have a Microsoft Surface Pro with that type of tablet interface, those are awesome. 
great ways to sculpt in Blender. You can use a mouse, it's just a little clunky and your fingers will hate you because of all the clicking. So I'm gonna switch over to, I've got a 10 year old mono price tablet that I'll be using, but um, I'll be using that. And my first step here is to do a little bit more blocking out. So I'm taking my approximate shape and refining it a little bit. Oh, also, let's make sure symmetry is turned on. By default, mirror on the x-axis is turned on and that's the way I want it. So for this process here, what I'm gonna be using primarily is gonna be clay strips, which is this tool up here for just adding large amounts of material to the piece. I am gonna be using a smooth operation to smooth things out. And I'm also gonna be using the grab operation. Now with the grab, it's very easy to screw things up. And one more note here, you'll notice I'm not trying to sculpt the eye. The eye is gonna be a separate mesh, to the sphere that I drop in a little bit later, because that presumably needs to be a perfectly spherical thing, and that's really hard to do with just purely sculpting. So what I've been doing here with the antenna, I guess, or the sucker, or whatever this thing is, I don't know. Um, I've just been adding a whole bunch of clay strips to it for the sole purpose with dynamic typography to add a, a whole bunch more geometry. So I'm putting a lot of more vertices in here. I'm doing that intentionally, even though there's not a lot of detail here, because in a moment I'm gonna use the smooth tool to smooth it out, and it's gonna look more cylindrical and more organic than before where it only had like 12 vertices or whatever making up the antenna. So it's gonna basically get a lot more organic shape. All right, well that's a pretty good rough sculpting of this character. I probably could clean up some of these rolls of fat a little bit, or whatever he is. It might be a blob, I'm not actually sure what this little critter is. I didn't design him. But what I want I'm gonna do now is, before I begin the final sculpting process, I want to reduce the amount of vertices he's got. So let me jump into wireframe here. You can see there's a whole bunch of vertices, lots and lots and lots but I don't want this many vertices. That makes it for a really huge STL file. So what I need to do now, let me just save my character. We're gonna go back to object mode and let's go back to solid. And we're gonna add a modifier. This one's gonna be called decimate. What it does, it reduces the amount of vertices as best as Blender can without significantly impacting the overall look of the piece. So let me try 0.5, which basically says keep 50% of the vertices. And then, oh, it actually went pretty fast. Sometimes it can take a long time. And what you notice down here in the corners where you can see your um, vertices and face count. So if I toggle this on and off, the difference is 50% right now. Um, I can look over what I've got. I kind of like that. That's not too far off from where I want to be right now. So I'm gonna to try to be even more aggressive and go down to 25%. That is still pretty good. Let me try 10%. Now, depending on the amount of detail you have at this point is how low you can go. The less detail you have, the lower you can go. And I don't have a whole lot of the key details. I just have the very big basic shapes of this guy. So let me bump it down to uh, ratio of 0.1 when I hit buttons correctly. And now the only thing that's starting to happen here is you can start to see a lot of little triangles on the surface, which I think I can, I can work with that. So I will start here and now I'm going to begin the final sculpting process. The first thing I'm going to do is add the other object for the eye so I know where that is. And then it's mainly just going to be smooth out the surface a little bit more, but more importantly, kind of cut in these grooves that are so iconic to his blobby nature. And for that, you're gonna use a combination of the crease tool, 
which does what it says it does, as well as the inverse of the pinch tool. They're kind of similar, but not exactly, and you can kind of figure out what you like better. The flatten tool can be used a little bit as well, but that thing's a little bit trickier to do exactly what you think it does. It does what you think it does, but it just doesn't do it in the way you might think it does. That makes no sense, but if you play around with it, it will. <laughs> okay, so let me run through that process, and hopefully you have something that looks pretty darn close to the final character. I forgot to mention, apply the decimate modifier before you go back to sculpt mode. Otherwise things go really, really, really slow. Oh, and then don't bother turning on dynamic typography until you're ready to add the final details. Otherwise you're going to do the whole process of just adding a bunch of crappy triangles you don't really need anyway. With that, take the export STL, send it over to your resin printer slicer, and print this guy out however you normally do your miniature workflow. And I think there we can call this project done. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how to approach miniature sculpting in Blender. This is definitely a huge topic and I've got a bunch more things planned on it for later down the road. Uh, this series probably won't continue a whole lot for a while. I've got about three other series that really need to get done first. It just happened to be the way this project fell into my workflow in terms of figuring out some other behind the scenes stuff um, with some friends. That's why this video dropped now instead of later on. But if you want to see those videos, go ahead and hit subscribe. Hit that like button if you like this kind of stuff. Blender for tabletop gaming seems to be kind of popular because a lot of people like 3D printing and no one's really sure how, how to go about it. And frankly, Blender is a beast of a program if you haven't figured that out already. So it helps always have someone to kind of guide you through what's going on. So thank you all for watching. Once again, I'm Jason. And with that, have a great week.